Perfect. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome again to class. And uh, I'll get right into it. This um, class, which is class four of course five of uh, Carmen Abhi Dharma Kosha uh, from ECI Classes Institute, just a commentary on the notes that I took years ago, adding uh, things to it, uh, is on um, how karma works. So basically, this is like the the big the big class. This you know we've talked about this before. We're going to come back to it again and again. But basically, the unity of karma and emptiness. So it's a really a really good class. So I'll just get right into it because I just noticed when I was looking through all my notes, it's like, wow, okay, there's a lot of material. Um, if we can't get through all of it, I'll just push it through to next week. It's no big deal. Um, but uh, yeah, some good stuff today. Okay, with that, we'll just start with the uh, Heart Sutra here on my phone. Okay. I'll mention the perfection of wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Thus, I've heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajgir and Mass Walter's Mountain. We are the great assembly of monks and nuns, the great assembly of bodhisattvas. That time the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time also Spirit of Balakashvara, the bodhisattva of the great being, was looking perfectly at the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom, looking perfectly also at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said, said to Spirit of Balakashvara, the bodhisattva of the great being, how should a son of the lineage train who wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Spirit of Alokashvara, the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, replied to Venerable Shariputra as follows. Shariputra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection of wisdom should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly, also at the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence, form is empty and emptiness is form. Emptiness is none other than form and form is none other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Sherry put you like this, all phenomena are emptiness having no characteristics. They are not produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no de decrease and no increase. Therefore, Sherry put you in emptiness, there's no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste. No tactile object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element, so forth, up to no mentality element, also up to no element of consciousness. There is no ignorance and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, and no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there's no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Sherry Putcher, because there's no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Past and beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became manifest and complete Buddhas in a state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the equal to the unequal mantra, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is proclaimed, Tayatam gada gada paragada parasam gada bodhisattva. Shariputra Bodhisattva, a great being, should train the profound perfection of wisdom like this. Then the Blessed One arose from that concentration and said to Spirit of Alakashvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, that he'd spoken well. Good, good, O Son of the Lynch, it's like that. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed, in that way the profound perfection of wisdom should be practiced and Tathagat as well to rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, the Venerable Shariputra, Spirit of Alakashvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, and the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted. And highly praised what I've been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, so I'm just going to sing just uh, seven uh, Gate mantras. You can sing with me if uh, you like here. <clears throat> Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva. 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 
ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे ओ हो दी सो ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे ओ हो दी सो ओम गाचे गाचे पारा गाचे पारा सम गाचे ओ हो दी सो So now let's just do our nine-point breathing. Breathing three breaths in, the left uh, close and left, um, but breathing out the right, getting rid of desirous attachment. Three breaths in through right nostril, out through the left, getting rid of anger and reactivity, and three full breaths through both nostrils, uh, sort of regular relaxed way, and just hold the last inhalation uh, for a few moments, putting your mind at the navel. Okay, so just finishing when you're ready here. I want to slowly start to lead people into meditation. <clears throat> so again, we can visualize ourselves. I'm just going to do a little bit of a shorter meditation today just to keep on time uh, with the material. So seating in a wide open space here, <clears throat> beautiful ground like lapis lazuli and that's surrounded by all sentient beings. How we usually do it, people closest to us, kind of like our inner mandala and then moving upwards from there. So we have our mother on our left, father on our right, representing sort of the two polarities in our body there, female and male energy that we get from our parents. The people we love the most behind us is support. And people we like the least to have issues with in front of us as objects of compassion and practice. And moving up from there, people from all over the world, people we're close to, and obviously strangers, all different countries and cultures with us together, like a big family. Animals from the animal realm, we can just think uh, insects to birds and bees and uh, fish and uh, sort of all the different beings, just from the very small, very large in the animal realm, all the different, different ecosystems. <clears throat> And um, coextensively, the spirit world is here as well, just all the astral, elemental, uh, and uh, ethereal realms and so forth, all the different kinds of spirit beings, countless ones like that, just like the animal realm. <coughs> Excuse me. Little nature spirits, all the way up to sort of uh, big dragons and nagas and so forth, all the bardo beings. Celestial beings, different gods and demigods. And then, of course, you think already that's like a lot of beings right there. And then we're expanding it just to the periphery of our consciousness here, just going on all beings in lower states of rebirth. All beings and hungry ghost beings. 
but again, everybody's all sort of blissed out and happy to meditate and be with each other. So it's like a gigantic outdoor concert. We're all here together. Okay, now we're just gonna <clears throat> visualize a beautiful dome, blue sky above us. And in front of us, we're gonna visualize just simple this time, rather than doing the whole refuge tree, we're just gonna do the central figure where Giorgio, uh, the long rim uh, visualization here is just Buddha Shakyamuni. So it's gonna kind of keep it kind of simple today. So this is just like being out in Manitoba or Montana or South Dakota or something, beautiful prairie and beautiful blue sky uh, in the summertime at midday. So we've got a big sun in the sky, Buddha Shakyamuni. And we can visualize them on a line throne, but if you like, you can even just have them kind of like floating in the sky, just like a beautiful big sun, summer sun, or, <clears throat> or we're halfway through August here, 2022. Uh, so coming up to harvest time, uh, we're getting sort of, you can feel the element change right now, and we are going from fire element to uh, earth element, sort of beautiful golden. So what we used to call Indian summer, kind of end of summer, beginning of, um, autumn time and then of course you get a beautiful sun at this time as well as you get the harvest moon with the full moon so we can just using those kinds of analogies images and metaphors see Buddha Shakyamuni in the sky beautiful golden body on a uh, lion throne a multicolored lotus thousand petals and a moon sun seat or you can feel like just floating and he's wearing three robes of a monk He has a begging bowl in his uh, left hand, a meditation posture just held in his lap with the muscle nectar. And the right hand, of course, is just in the subduing loop of touching the earth. Let the earth goddess, let Gaia be the witness that I deserve, as you know, to be confronting his Mars there before enlightenment, that I deserve this enlightenment because I've created karma to um, awaken this state. <clears throat> So he's a beautiful golden energy body, very, very blissful, kind of like light, so you can kind of see through him. So just make him huge in the sky here. And then at his heart is his Sambhogakaya uh, form, sort of higher angelic beatific form of Hankar Vajradhara and Vajradhatushvara. So they're kind of like a couple, boyfriend, girlfriend. But I like uh, Urgen Tukarimpashe used to say that Samantabad and Samantabadri, similarly, he said, or your old grandpa and your old grandma, in a sense, it's just kind of like your <clears throat> um, heritage, your divine heritage, your divine center that you're rediscovering. So it's like a lineage, but a nature lineage that's always there, just like all your genetic line from your grandparents, great grandparents is always within you. So is your Buddha nature. So this is your grandpa and your grandma, except they're 16 years old. <laughs> they're just uh, young and beautiful and uh, have beautiful sapphire blue bodies with crowns and silks and so forth. So, of course, he's in lotus position with his bell on his left hand, door to his right, crossed. And Vajradhatushvari is straddling him with her arms around her neck with a skull cut and medicinal nectar in her left hand and her factory group chopping knife or cleaver in her right. And if you'd like, you can visualize between them a beautiful blue hum letter, H-U-M, or the sort of stylized Tibetan or Sanskrit syllable. <clears throat> and this is softly emitting a rainbow light, so the five elemental colors of um, blue, green, white, uh, yellow, and red. So taking refuge, I and all sentient beings into which you can lightly go for refuge to go to Dharma and Sangha. I and all sentient beings to which you can lightly go for refuge to go to Dharma and Sangha. I and all sentient beings to which you can lightly go for refuge to go to Dharma and Sangha. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. It's just sort of generating Bodhicitta at our heart here. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. The virtues we collect from other perfections may we become better for the benefit of all. So setting our intention here, <clears throat> and we just choose a uh, visualization for refuge here. We uh, start to uh, first 
uh, just visualize beautiful white lights and nectars coming down. So for all sentient beings around us, out of the sort of beautiful big sun and Buddha Shakti Muni, we can just have sort of a soft uh, uh, white light coming down, almost like moonlight, purifying them of all their negativities, flushing on all their bad energies and bad karma, like smoke or tar or ashes or so forth. And then for us, we can have the light, but also like a nectar. So just like a stream of nectar, like a little fountain coming down into us, around our head. And filling our whole body with white light and white nectar, kind of like a milk. Sort of cut with water, so it's kind of sort of flows and sort of lighter. And this is like some heavy duty uh, solvent or soap where it's just flushing out again all our negativity, some body, speech, and mind out the bottom of our body. And just like pulling your crystal wine glass out of the dishwasher, which I don't think anyone does because it'll probably break, but just this idea that you pull the crystal out and it's crystal clear and clean. So just looking down at our body and our mind's eye, we can see that we're just like crystal malice and all sentient beings. Feeling very, very happy and blissful. And now lights and nectar start to come down to this time, uh, sort of a golden color. And this first is purification, second is the virtue or merit, <clears throat> visualization. And this is filling us up all with golden nectar. And uh, very, very blissful and we're receiving all the wisdom, compassion, power of all the Buddhas. And just all teachings and initiation kind of download zip files or downloading apps of enlightenment into our soul body here. Complete transference of all qualities, energies, and powers into us. And generating the four immeasurables of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. May everyone be happy. May everyone be free from misery. May no one ever be separated from their happiness. May everyone have equanimity, free from hatred or attachment. So again, just that golden light, nectar coming down like a waterfall and then coming out of our heart like a big bubble in all directions to all sentient beings. <clears throat> going out and giving them or sort of awakening in them the four measurables. So love, compassion, joy, and equanimity, wanting all beings to be happy, wanting them not to suffer. The joy of nirvana, sort of a beautiful creative power, affirmative power going out. And equanimity, just balanced mind beyond hope and fear, beyond anger and attachment having a warm, uh, caring, friendly attitude and open attitude towards all beings. We need seven limb practice. I'm just think of the mind, seven things we're offering, sort of the, the limbs holding up the table of our practice, kind of prostration, offering, confession, Rejoicing, requesting all holy beings to, to stay, requesting them to teach, and dedication. So again, just prostrating here in our mind, showing respect to Buddha Shakyamuni, who is representing the three jewels and all holy beings, all light beings. And doing prostration to him, having a mind, if it's us for the body, for speech, singing praises, mantras and dharanis, and then the mind having a mind of faith or devotion. And for offering, just sending from our heart, again, like I always say, billions of flowers or candles or lamps. We want to make light offerings. I like flowers, so you can offer in a big garden or rose petals. Or just empty space, beautiful, beautiful gardens. Or again, beautiful butter lamps, if you like, representing Dharmakaya wisdom.
So now, uh, confession declaration and rejoicing. So this is kind of um, looking in the mirror, uh, right when you wake up in the morning and you look at yourself, especially you know, now that I'm middle age, and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that's me. This is seeing all your, <laughs> your shortcomings and character flaws and everything else, uh, all sort of the negative uh, shadow parts of yourself in an Indian sense. And here we are declaring them standing naked before the Buddhas and all sentient beings. Yeah, this is me. This is what I've created through all my delusions. And yep, I'm slowly getting rid of these self-overcoming bit by bit. I'm walking towards enlightenment here, taking off all these dirty clothes one step at a time. Trying hard to do this. You know, sort of um, so <clears throat> personal growth or self-overcoming uh, path to enlightenment here. And at the same time, the positive thing is, is that you step out of the shower, put all your makeup on. Yeah, you're ready to go. This is the good thing that we're rejoicing all the progress we've made on just compare yourself to before you started the Dharma, what things used to look like, uh, and just even before you've grown spiritually. So rejoice in all that, rejoice of all the good qualities and uh, acts of kindness and goodness and virtue in the world, especially those of the Buddhas and holy beings. And this is what we're headed towards, this kind of goodness, step by step. That was an old Bruce Coburn lyric, I think. That's my dad's favorite musician, and I like him too, but Bruce Coburn used to say, um, I cast a shadow, but if I'm casting a shadow, that means I'm walking towards the light, towards the sun and our enlightenment. So the, think of this just the heart, confession and the rejoicing going together there. Now holding up our hands, beautiful lion throne, and we send that out and sort of dissolves into Buddha and we say, please always stay with us. Buddha Shakyamuni, all Buddhas, all of our gurus, never leave us. Always keep that door open to guidance and blessings. And then we send up from our heart again a eight spoke golden Dharma chakra as well. <clears throat> so just stay with us. And of course, please continue to teach us and guide us. That's what staying with us means. But we ask also formally, always please continue to teach us and uh, be the light in our lives. And then dedicating everything we're doing here today, everything that we do just on a day-to-day -day basis, just holding this in our hearts here and sending it out, dedicating it may be a cause for the awakening, the enlightenment of all sentient beings. <clears throat> Okay, so now just last offering here we do before we do the dissolution. Let's make a mandala offering in our hearts here. We're going to sprinkle with perfume and spread with flowers, the great mountain, the four lands, some of them seen as a bitter land, and offer thus that all beings enjoy such pure lands. I offer them the sense of loss that the objects that give rise to my attachment, virgin hatred and ignorance, my bodies, uh, friends, strangers, all of our wealth and enjoyments. I offer these to the holy beings. Please bless us to be released from the three poisonous lands. Last one I offer this uh, mandal to you, our precious protector, our root guru. I offer you the precious mountains, four lands, precious substances, treasure vase, sun and moon, which have arisen from my aggregate sources and elements as assets of the spontaneous born exalted wisdom of this and that's the outer, inner, and secret offerings here from Mandela that we're holding that beautiful, purified galaxy of enjoyments and all beautiful things. And we send this up to the Shakyamuni. Send forth this jewel Mandela to you, precious gurus. Om Namah Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om So again, shamanic reciprocity, the circle here of offerings and blessings and we have a water wheel here. So we may open our hearts and generously mm -hmm. offer. Now the holy beings and light beings give their blessing or energy back into our open hearts. So again, gold and lights and nectars coming down like sunbeams into us and all beings around us. And 
compiling this positive energy. We're going to have a dissolution and meditation here. Let's visualize the Buddha Shakyamuni starts emitting beautiful golden light like the sun. And then that starts to sort of dissolve inward. So into, if you're visualizing this lion throne, into that, the lotus um, in the sun seat. Or just if you're visualizing in the sky, just seated in lotus position, just his whole body starts to dissolve inward into his heart. And of course, it dissolves into the divine couple Vajradhara and Vajradhati Shvara. <clears throat> so, of course, in scale, in the sky here, they're really, really big. And so, even them, you know, they're sort of smaller at his heart, they're still really big in the sky. So, then they start to shrink too, almost like condensing a little bit, radiating out beautiful five colored lights. And now they're about the size of our pinky fingernail or uh, sunflower seed. down to the crown of our head, turn around so they're facing the same direction as us, or about a foot above us now, beautiful little blue diamond or blue piece of lapis, blue sapphire. And like a little star, they start to descend into the crown of our head, and slowly, like the leaf falling just in front of our spine, the central channel, slowly start to descend until they come to our hearts here. And once they hit your heart, it starts to melt and dissolve. And all that energy and uh, qualities go directly into our mind. We feel great, great bliss and great joy. So again, sense of totality, selflessness, peace, rest. And at the same time, positive power, potential, creativity, great, great happiness. And then great, great spaciousness here and openness. And we'll just meditate on this feeling here.
Philippines and coming out of meditation. <clears throat> okay, so let me just put in my reading glasses here and we can just sort of get into the material here. So it's the same thing, got about a half an hour today. I wanted to leave a little bit more time uh, for the class. And uh, again, if people have a question or a comment or whatever at the end, last five minutes or so, we can take time for that. Wonderful. So for today, it's again, I guess the class you can call it is how karma works. So what we're going to talk about is the um, um, unity basically of karma and emptiness, which we've talked about before. And this is, I guess you could say the the um, diamond core, so to speak, sort of like the most important thing to learn about in uh, Buddhism, but in particular, uh, it's stressed in Tibetan Buddhism and in particular in our sect of the Gelupa tradition. So <clears throat> we've said before in the Kadampa tradition coming into Tibet in the 11th century with the Tisha, Deepak Karvajana from West Bengal. So he teaches <clears throat> what at the time was some people had a hard time understanding was the unity of the vast path and the profound paths. In other words, the negative critical uh, teachings on emptiness where we're taking away or deconstructing and then the positive teachings on uh, bodhicitta or Buddha nature that uh, you know comes from uh, Arya Sangha uh, receiving it from Buddha Maitreya. So basically, you know, that the glass is half empty and half full at the same time. How does that make sense? Well, he shows you uh, in teachings on the Lam Rim how that's possible. And then 300 years later, or so we have uh, founder of our tradition, New Kadampa tradition, Jason Kappa, Losen Drapa, who takes that and also wants to show two things that at the time, the uh, 1400s, that had started being confusing for certain people in Tibet, which is how do the teachings of Sutra, the open conceptual, more public teachings of Buddhism, the old Sutras and Shastras and stuff, fit in with the esoteric, mystical, um, very private and secret teachings of Tantra. So the it's the unity of Sutra and Tantra, based again on Atisha's teachings of the unity of the vast and profound paths. And all of this boils down to that emptiness is understood for us as the two truths, the, the ultimate truth and conventional truth, or as Jason Kapp says, the best way to look at emptiness is through dependent arising, dependent origination. The emptiness of dependent origination shows two truths. So what is dependent origination? That's karma. So emptiness and karma go together like two sides of the same coin. So that's what this class is today. So this is the big take home. If we understand how karma works, how karma and emptiness works, we understand how enlightenment works. It shows how we can become enlightened. And it shows how tantra works, how we can become enlightened in one lifetime. So this is an important class today. So these teachings today, um, notes I have here based on Jay Sankapa's total illumination, the real intent of the middle way. He's written a whole bunch of different texts on Nagarjuna in the middle way. This is one of them. And basically, the presentation of karma that you get in uh, the Glupa tradition in, uh, is that <clears throat> sort of discussed and presented in the mind only or yoga charge at a mansion school of emptiness. So that what's interesting, I mean, this is a long, if we ever did a class on tenant theory, we could go in big long discussions to see how the mind only school rises out of teachings uh, on perception, concept formation, emptiness from the lower Satrantika school. And mind only school ends up sort of solving or showing how perception and concepts work. In other words, how can I know a changing thing? I know it through uh, sort of a conceptual mediation or what they call an aspect, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, we can talk about that maybe sometime in the future. But what's interesting is the mind only school has a very, very profound understanding of karma such that the middle way school or the higher schools basically keep it. They, un they just want to sort of refine the mind only school understanding of karma a little further. But the mind only school kind of nails it, so to speak. Like they sort of come up with a really, really good understanding of karma. So Jason Kappa here is basically going to explain that. What is the mind only school's understanding of karma? How does that fit in with an understanding of karma and emptiness? So the mind only school, uh, uh, Yoga Charge at a Mantan school, uh, what they say for karma 
is that, let's say the classic thing Vishen and Michael always use is you see, the, you have an experience of seeing an angry face, someone being angry. So when you see someone like whatever, you're, you know, road rage, or you're having a fight with someone at Starbucks or something, you see someone's angry face here. So your consciousness, eye consciousness allows you to see the person. The eye faculty, of course, your retina, everything takes in an image of the person, transmits it to, you know, your mind or your, your, your eye conscious goes in. <clears throat> then basically what's interesting is from all that kind of experience or data, based upon this, a consciousness or awareness arises and you end up seeing these qualities of the person being angry. So what, what that sort of consciousness is that arises, what you might hear, or is an imprint or a back chat. Back check is a Tibetan word. We usually use the term imprint uh, in English. So these are sort of stored in the mind that basically like a seed, or I guess nowadays we'd say kind of like a computer program, almost like a little text that you get. Like I get texts all the time from Canadian Tire and Bing coming in all the time on my phone. Back check's kind of like that in your mind. And this, in the old analogy here, it's like the seed is in your mind and it grows and it produces an appearance or experience. So basically like it creates or grows an eye consciousness awareness that you end up seeing as an angry face. So what's the take home when we say mind only school, like when you go to university or you're at a Buddhist monastic college and it's like, okay, today's class we're studying mind only. What do we mean by the term mind only? That's what's interesting. What they the, the real sense of mind only or yoga char chitta mantra, of course, like chit means uh, uh, mind in Sanskrit, is what the mind is seeing is the mind. In other words, what you're interacting with is your own mediation of experience. What you're seeing is your back chaks or your dispositional mind. So what's interesting is we always see think that we're seeing objects, but what we're seeing really is our own interpretation of things. Of course, this isn't really earth shattering, even in Western philosophy, we all believe this now. Oh man, you do you, I do me, or what? Like we're always sort of saying that there's kind of like a conceptual, uh, cultural, whatever you want to say, interface between how we see things. Everyone, of course, accepts this nowadays. We're looking at this at more sort of a personal, or maybe you could say spiritual or existential dimension here. So mind is looking at mind. When you see a person being angry at you, that's a karmic appearance that's basically growing from a seed or a backtrack in your mind. So again, um, you think, okay, yes, so what? We all know this. But again, in your day-to-day -day life, when you're going around doing your errands or shopping, do you really believe this? Do you really think you're interacting just with yourself? When you see angry people giving you sort of like the, the feedback or kind of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre called the coefficient of adversity, like basically on a scale, how much negative pushback from the world are you getting, right? But the point is, that's not them. That's you. That's your mind, right? So how does this happen? So it says the back track produces the mental event that uh, looks like your eye faculty and you interpret it to be your eye. So it's basically what they, it's kind of interesting in the mind only school, uh, they end up saying that there's eight consciousnesses. So this is kind of unique to the mind only school uh, in the lower um, Vaivashka and Satrantika uh, Buddhist systems, they only believe that there's six uh, consciousnesses. We sort of believe that too when you're studying low rig. We talk about, of course, the five senses and then the six mental sense. So we have five, uh, uh, six consciousnesses, right? Mind only school ends up positing two more. So you think, okay, well, what's that? Well, the seven consciousness, they say, is just your delusions, your deluded consciousness uh, or ignorance, you could say. So they call that clistomanus. And of course, that consciousness, once you get enlightened, ends up kind of disappearing. It's kind of like a fake mind, so to speak. But the eighth consciousness is what they call a lay of ajana or storehouse consciousness. And you could say that that's kind of like your real root mind. The uh, six awarenesses, awareness conscious, the sixth sense consciousness, your mental conscious, come out of this, what they call storehouse consciousness. So uh, what... Um, the storehouse consciousness or, or eighth consciousness is for mind only school is the place, I guess, like the computer, the hard drive, or your phone, where these back checks or imprints are. Your karmic seeds are in 
this mind only, uh, this sort of, um, I should say, storehouse consciousness. So in the day, whatever, when Buddha is teaching this 2,500 years ago, we don't have the internet, we don't have anything. So what they say is it's almost like a grain silo or a barn. You keep, you put all your grain, your barley or chickpeas or whatever being, it's all stored. That's like your mind. All these imprints or dispositions or seeds, so to speak, are in the eighth consciousness. So how this works for mind only school is they say when a seed ripens in a lay of vagina, the eighth consciousness, it produces a mind and an object at the same time. So in other words, let's say again, using the Starbucks thing, I go and whatever. I mean, this is, you know, we've all had something, then and then, whatever, the latte comes up from Matthew and some guy grabs it. I'm like, hey, dude, that's my latte. And I see, but what's interesting is the first thing I see is I'm angry. And then I see him like, eh, and I see him looking like a bad person, right? And maybe he's even angry at me. So in my mind, I think, okay, total asshole or total jerk. Like, and his appearance is such. So where is that uh, experiential event coming from? How is that happening? How is this being produced? Well, from the eightfold consciousness, there is me, this sense of self or mind that arises and the, it's, it's object in the situation, the other person grabbing my latte, that's mine. So what uh, mind only school says is that the backjack's producing my consciousness and the object at the same time, okay? So is there someone independent of that experience? Is there a me that's independent of that experience? No, it's being produced from a seed in my mind. Is there a person independent of that experience being produced? No, how I see them is produced from that karmic seed. So basically what's interesting is that there is only this eighth consciousness with seeds going off producing movies, so to speak. So the emptiness for a mind only school is that the emptiness is, is all that process is happening by itself from these seeds. There's nothing independent of that process. So in other words, the emptiness is seeing that the object and the mind come from the same, uh, the same karmic seed or same karmic potential or back jack. So that's ignorance is me not knowing that. Grasping an inherent existence for me in the mind only school is not seeing that seeds are producing everything. I'm sort of still thinking there's an inherent me separate from these seeds, separate from the objects I'm engaging in. So the emptiness here is that everything's coming from karma. So what I'm really seeing is my own mind, okay? Literally, I'm just seeing these uh, back checks or seeds producing the perceiver and producing the perceived, producing the seer, producing the seen, all from the same karmic seed. So literally, your experience of the whole universe is the experience of your mind. So, of course, the good thing is we can think about all the uh, negative um, things of this is, oh, my God, well, it's producing all these seeds, bad things. But, of course, good seeds produce experiences, too. So all enlightenment is, is collecting good seeds or dispositions or perceptual habits that end up producing good appearances. So all the Buddha is, is just sitting there blissed out and appearing like, bing, 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 and what's being produced by the Buddha is ripening into all these amazing experiences. The point is that it's you're in a movie or in a complete simulation, like Philip K. Dick would say, this is all computer simulation and all matrix. None of it's real. It's being produced by a lay of a jana, right? So the point is, is that, okay, well, what's being produced? What's the movie I'm watching? I don't know about you, but the one I'm in kind of sucks. But the point is the big picture is who's responsible for this and who can change it? Well, I can because they're just back checks. They're just seeds producing these things. So how is a seed planted? How do I do these things? Well, of course, I do these things through my actions of body, speech, and mind. So here's the example. I sort of yell at someone or I get angry at someone, whatever. I got angry at someone driving the other day. Um, this... Um, <clears throat> seed ends up being sort of planted or imprint means implanted in the eightfold of lay of a jana consciousness. And this is seed. What's interesting is they say the seed isn't physical or mental. It's not something I find. It's like almost like a bare dispositional energy. Okay. That's what stays in your mind. So how is it? What's interesting is you get into a uh, big debate 
or where are these seeds? If like basically, if these seeds are producing the mind and producing its objects, but they're neither material or physical because they produce material things, objects, and psychic or uh, psychological things like the mind. So what are they? They're, they basically, it's kind of like an energy, you know, kind of like a habitual energy, so to speak. And this is why we talk about in Tantra that the mind has these stains that have to be cleaned out. They produce dualistic appearance. They have to be cleaned out by completion stage practice, by tumo or inner fire. Like having that experience of tumo or inner fire that ends up producing clear light experience and you meditating this of emptiness, this is what allows you to perceive the true the two truths uh, simultaneously that allows you to be fully enlightened as a Buddha. So they say the obstacle for this are these stains on your mind? What are these stains? It's these back chats. These back chats are the stains. These kind of like primordial dispositions or it's almost like stimulus response and old behaviorism, right? Where you ring a bell and the dog starts to salivate. There's these kinds of automatic, um, I guess almost like computer programs in your mind, so to speak. You know, it, like you set your email for the vacation um, message. Oh, Matthew's away for two weeks. Bing, anytime you send an email, that's what you get back. It's these kinds of back checks in your mind, most of them being negative, that are there kind of lying in wait, programmed in there that have to be wiped out or cleaned out, kind of like in the old days where you would erase your whole computer disk in your computer because it was flawed or something. That's what we're doing when we're doing Tantra. This is what allows us to basically reprogram the mind, see everything as being pure in a Buddha paradise. So these backtracks in the uh, mind-only school are contained within the Eightfold Consciousness. And what's interesting is this is a big thing is that where are they any, like, how do they, they can't be inherently existent because nothing is. So these imprints, how do they stay? And it's the, the, the answer you get in these sort of higher level discussions in Buddhism is they're changing things. They say backjacks are functioning things. They perform a function. They create appearance, create a mind and an object, but they're technically turned off. So it's like a light switch right? So how they reproduce themselves, they're always changing. They end up reproducing themselves in the mind. So this is how they can stay with you for thousands of years. There are things that are passed along in your mind, but they're not activated yet, right? So they say they're changing things. So they're not inherently, since they're not sort of solid or they're virtual, but they're reproducing themselves at every moment, but they're turned off. So when they're karmically triggered, they turn on. So this is why, whatever, a thousand years ago is some Norman Knight in Jerusalem, I banged some guy in the head, and somehow that karmic seeds come all the way down, hasn't been turned on. But I go to save on here in Nelson, and I, and then that gets triggered, and I get hit on the head, it's a big coffee can hits me or something. It's like, whatever. So this little, <laughs> this little back check has kind of gone down a, a thousand years until the right karmic triggers, which of course are beyond us. We don't know what they are. Flip that switch and it activates. And what do I get? I get myself, my mind of me is born, my sense of subjectivity. Oh, I just got hit on the head and I get the object, the stupid coffee can or the stupid person that hit me on the head. So the back check ends up producing. Once it's produced, of course, it disappears. It's gone. So that's karma, like this is how it works. Now, how does it actually, they say here, one of the, with back taxes, um, uh, the mind creating the mind here, right? So what goes in is end up what's coming out, whether it's positive uh, back checks or negative back checks, right? Uh, a big thing that actually strengthens back checks, allows them to pass on, it's interesting, is your motivation and the object of the karma itself. So we talked about this earlier, is that if I do good things or bad things towards powerful objects, it increases the energy or the back check of the seeds. The intention also creates the energy of the seed as well. So a lot of the karma that I do, that's neutral karma, that's kind of unconscious, stupid karma, those seeds are really light or really insubstantial. They just get passed along, right? And you probably don't even notice they're going. So you can see that things done with great intensity produce a greater result or create a bigger seed or a bigger app or computer program in your mind. And that ends up being watered. Like they say a lot, um, 
in the Prasangika system, they say that a uh, big thing that sort of waters, uh, like plants the seeds or back checks or waters them is actually your experience, the deed itself. So seeing yourself do things and kind of doubling down with the experience really plants the seed hard, right? So we can see this when you create karma, like let's say whatever, you, you hate your whatever, your neighbor, uh, just seeing your neighbor mowing the lawn and you're like, oh, I hate that guy. And then eh, I took his mail, his flyer, and I ripped it up and threw it without him noticing them. Eh, just seeing myself doing all this negative stuff, that actually ends up planting or punching in these back tracks a lot harder and a lot stronger. So it's interesting, they say that what's watering them where they're being passed on in your mind is your ignorance is you know the the fact that you don't even know that things are coming from back chats you don't even see that they're producing the karma is producing you as a mind and, and your object of mind right all that's in sort of sort of pushing the process along right paying it forward but what strengthens them again is the object that you're doing to but most of all your intention your mind so you can see this like when you kill something and you have a sense of regret. Oh my God, the earwig I stepped on him. Oh, I feel my Buddhist, I shouldn't be stepping on the earwig. Oh my God, poor little guy. And you put him out and you bury him in the backyard or something. We know that that back check's very different than this one guy in Toronto always used to say, hey, bug, your history. Like when, you know, like you see the spider and pow, like seeing yourself doing karma strengthens it, ends up really planting these back checks that ends up. Um, ends up being passed along so there we go so that's just i've got about five minutes left here um i just wanted to introduce we'll have to talk about this at a later date too because it's a very sort of subtle uh concept here so in the pressing geek system the mind only school ends up saying well where are these back checks well they're in the eighth consciousness right now what's interesting is almost like the moment whatever 1500 years ago all these mind only school people in India started pausing this as a philosophy, everybody started jumping all over it. Because they end up saying this eightfold consciousness can't exist in a strict definitional sense. Why? Because it's a mind without an object. So it's an infinite regress or self contradiction. Right. So anyway, I won't get into this. It's a big debate. You know, you said there's no I said this back and forth between the mind only and other schools, but other schools end up saying this doesn't hang together properly philosophically or logically. So the question is, if the Eightfold Consciousness as a, a posited idea, as a place to put the seeds doesn't really work, okay, let's get rid of the Eightfold Consciousness. But then the question comes is, where are the seeds then, right? If there's no computer for your little computer disk to be, and if there's no phone, where's my phone? Okay, right here. Okay, let's say this is the phone with all the programs. All right, there's no phone. Well, where's the programs? Where's my apps if there's no phone, right? If mind is empty, where are the back chats? That's a good question, isn't it? So this is actually a huge part of Jason Kappa's discussion of mind only school revolves around this because we all like the mind only school understanding of karma. We want to keep it but it all hangs on one thing, this eightfold consciousness, the lay of agenda, which when we look at it, it's a little shaky. It, it doesn't look like it exists. So where are these bat chats? Well, what's interesting is that technically, if they're neither, they're just an energy, they're not mature, they're not physical, they're not physical, they're not mental. Basically, they're nowhere. And that's what allows them to exist is the fact that they're completely virtual, right? It's like the internet. The internet is between computers, right? It's not anywhere. Like when you, right now, it's, I'm looking at myself talking on the screen for Zoom. Where is this experience that we're having right now, right? We're all in our different places here on the computer, but where is the experience of our Zoom call or this class? It's a middle way. It's not. It's in the middle somewhere, but we can't find it, right? So this is a faint. One of my favorite writers, of course, Marcel Proust, always talked about this in terms of the what he called the virtuals, whole book, uh, right? Of uh, um, the uh, recollection of lost time. Uh, you know, but a you know, famous one in France, in search of lost time, is how they translate it in English. Is he always said the virtual is uh, 
real but not ideal, uh, uh, ab what no, abstract but not ideal, um, real but not concrete, right? This is a great thing. In other words, things are ideal but not abstract. Like in other words, it's all ideas, but they're not some kind of intellectual product. They're real, you experience them. They're real, but they're not concrete. Right, they're changing their virtual. That's a very good definition. So the Prasangika schools ends up saying, where are the bat chats? They're just in you as a virtual product. They're in what they call the, the, the nominal I. So what's interesting is basically all your karma is within your experience itself. It's not outside of you. It's within the movie itself. And that's why it's changeable. Do you see, this is a really hard concept to get, but do you see how profound that is? So what's interesting in the Matrix movie, there is an outside to the Matrix, right? You've got the good world, you go out then you're like, whatever, everything sucks, the world's exploded, blah, blah, blah. So it's kind of like you, the real you outside of the Matrix and then the fake you inside of the Matrix, okay? What we're talking about here is that the eighth consciousness functions as kind of an outside of the virtual system. But the point is in Buddhism, if everything is interconnected, there can't be an outside. So if we get rid of the Eightfold Consciousness, we're back in the matrix. There's no outside the matrix. But the point is, the you see the matrix as the matrix. So within the matrix, you can wake up. Is that clear? It's kind of, don't you see the seeds are held together virtually within you? They're not outside of you. And that's why they're completely plastic and completely flexible. We'll talk about this again. I just want to kind of plant the seed here, but that's extremely important because you see then that reality itself is completely plastic and changeable. So if you plant the right seeds, you can be enlightened because all this is is a movie of seeds or imprints, okay? Anyway, this is a hard class, but this is a really, really profound idea. This is the unity, of course, of karma and emptiness. That's what we're getting at. Um, so again, and, and the big thing is, like I've said before, uh, all karma is, is of course, the label, how things appear as a label to you. That when the backtrack or a seed or ear imprint ripens, what it produces is you seeing something as something, a label on a base. That's the product. That's kind of how you see. Um, anyway, there is a quick little discussion of here from the Uttara Tantra Shastra from Maitreya where he shows basically how things um, ripen. And I'll talk about that next week quick. It's just a short little thing. I think I've gone a little bit too much. It's like too heavy uh, concepts one after the other here. So uh, this is a little short thing. I'll bring it up next week. Okay, so anyway, um, just quickly, any, any questions? <laughs> I know that's a big one, but I just I want to, I want people to sort of think about that a little bit. And again, this is a profound understanding of karma. This isn't the colloquial comic book version of karma we talk about. Like, oh, Matthew, you've been a jerk. You couldn't find parking when you went shopping. Eh, that's karma. Like everyone has that on Twitter. Oh, Matthew said something. Now he's canceled karma. Eh. Like that's kind of the kind of cartoon version of karma. We're talking about a real deep understanding of karma in terms of the structure of reality itself. And again, that's the karma we don't want to believe in because, oh my God, the responsibility, but that's the liberating potential of karma, right? Is that we can see that we can create anything we want. Uh, we can create these sacred divine spaces. Anything or what do you guys think? Or is that enough? Yes. Um. <clears throat> Uh, Matthew, um, in some schools of philosophy, they talk about solipsism, you know, yeah. that, that people get trapped in their own mind-made structures. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, like in the Alaya, in the Yogacharian yeah. system, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going on the basis that the Majjabika sort of uh, applies to dissolves for all intents and purposes the alaya back into the matrix yeah um so through some process of uh negation mm -hmm. is, yeah uh so the seeds in the alaya mm -hmm. um as you were pointing out they reabsorb into this 
neither this, neither that of the yeah. Jamaica. Is that kind of the process that happens? I guess you can, yeah, you could say this. And again, I'm not a Buddhist scholar. No. Whatever. You, as you know, you're going to get a bunch of people in from whatever you have to either, oh, God, what an idiot. I can't believe you're listening to this guy. But I'm just saying that it, you know, from what I understand, this kind of stuff, even taking the Asian Classics Institute, and again, I'm providing different metaphors and analogies here, which might work or not work or be correct or not correct. But that's, I, I believe that that's kind of how it works. And this is what, because you see the difference between the Hinayana path, if you're trying to be an Arhat, they don't, in Theravada schools, you can't get rid of backjacks. You can't get rid of imprints. They're there all the time. What you get rid of is your capacity to activate them, right? So you, the, the light switch is always on the wall. You've just cut the wire. So it's still there. Technically, someone could, if you get a good electrician, they can put the wire back and all they'll go off again. But once you've realized emptiness or an R hat, those back checks will never ripen. So that's why things still look dualistically to an R hat, but th they know they're not. When they go into the meditation emptiness, there's emptiness, they see everything's just their mind. When we're doing Mahayana particular Tantra, we're getting rid of dualistic appearance altogether, which was, means we see the two truths simultaneously, emptiness and all dependently arisen things. That's because we've gotten rid of back chats and we see things. That's how you become a Buddha and not just an Arhat or a saint. So what's interesting is that has to be where the back chats are virtually within the system for that to be possible. So I had this, this is a big thing in phenomenology <coughs> on visceral six uh, Cartesian meditation, which is if mind is creating the world, how does it create other people? So this is where you got into a problem in, in Western phenomenology. It's a problem Descartes had, whatever, in his uh, meditations. So Husserl says it's great, as he says, if I'm synthesizing or constituting objects, there's a certain point where I end up having to constitute other people. How do I constitute other people constituting me? I'm constituting myself. It's a self-contradiction. Right. So I asked my first teacher, again, Kelsey Tarch in this. In other words, if I'm creating everything here, is this solipsism? Right. Which seems like it is. So I said, hey, put my hand up in class there in Toronto back, whatever. And I said, uh, you know, Tarch, and I got a question. If my mind's cr creating myself and creating other people, it, how do I create other people creating me? I'm creating myself. It's a self it's an infinite regress, it's a self-contradiction, it's not logical. And he said, Matthew, you don't exist. But, right? In other words, you see the problem with that is you can see solipsism is based on what they call in Kantian philosophy, a transcendental ego, putting the world together, right? In other words, there has to be some real me as a Matthew, solipsistic creating the world. But the point is, I'm a virtual product just like you are. That's how Buddhism gets around solipsism. There's no one there anyway. So basically, that's why in Zen they call it suchness. It's a selfless process happening by itself. You know, it's, it's kind of like you know, Nietzsche talks about will to power of this beautiful self-creating universe with no self in it. That's how we get where we sort of sit back is who's doing all this karma? Who's, who's making all these movies, right? It seems like I am, but when I dissolve the self, the movies are just kind of happening on their own. It's kind of strange, right? So that's how you get out of solipsism from a Buddhist point of view, you know? But also it's not a rational point of view. Like you can see how unreasonable this is in a big picture. But again, our materialistic Western paradigm is just as ridiculous, where all of this, including science discovering all this is magically happening by itself right, from the Big Bang, or, or like somehow from quantum particles, because up to me studying quantum particles, making particle accelerators. That's just as selfless, as ridiculous, as kind of fact chats happening by themselves, right? In the end, you just sit back and you're like, wow, everything's empty, right? Yeah. Uh, don't ask too many questions, <laughs> right? <laughs> So anyway, how's that? Is that a, it's it's eight yeah. after yeah. nine. I don't want to go too long here and stuff. So again, we can, we'll have a discussion uh, at the end of, we've got about three more classes to go here. Um, 
I have to go to work tomorrow. I'm in Korea. I'm in Australia. And in the next two weeks, I'm going to record classes because I'm just going to be everywhere. I'm back in uh, Nelson on the 30th of September. And then for the next two weeks of September, we'll finish the course with two live classes. So I'll do that. So anyway, let me uh, press, uh, we'll do a quick uh, dedication here. Uh, the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, the power of our pure screen intention, may all of our dharma wishes be fulfilled. May we really understand karma and may we really understand emptiness, that we become enlightened and help all sentient beings come to the same realization themselves. Okay, dedicate. Stop here.